Since last spring, more than 100,000 have lost their lives due to the opiate epidemic. We're very pleased to have with us two local moms, Lori Lewis and Amy Sullivan, to share their stories about how the opiate crisis has impacted their lives and what they are doing to bring awareness to help save other lives. So thank you for being on the show. Welcome to have you back, Lori, on the show. So. Thank you. It's been a couple of years, more than I thought. So <laughs> glad to really have it. And, and Amy, glad to have you here Thank as you. well. Thank you. So, why don't you begin just tell us a little bit about yourself and, and how this has impacted you? Um, Lori, why don't we start with you? Sure. So, um, I lost my oldest son, Ryan, um, seven and a half years ago. Uh, he was 23 to um, the opioid um, epidemic, fentanyl overdose. Uh, since that time, I've become very involved in. Um, the recovery community, um, whatever I can do whenever I'm asked, go talk at forums, um, go into schools, um, and try and educate both um, parents, students, loved ones about the epidemic. Um, because for us, we were just a normal family. Uh, and we still are trying to wrap our heads around how this happened. Um, but so I volunteer um, with the FBI, we go into the um, elementary schools and um, junior highs talk about opioids um, and they are, they know what it is. Um, I also volunteer for um, Thrive Family Addiction Support, Steve Rumler Foundation, which is um, uh, where Through Connections met Amy uh, and Amy contacted me and told me about um, her book and a um, little bit about her and um, being a historian and she came over and feels like we talked for hours um, <laughs> and it was wonderful and so um, it was great just listening to her and and talking with her and yeah yeah and what I hear when I interview other people they say they were just a normal family they never thought this would happen to them yeah so but we want to hear about you too Amy just tell yeah. us a little bit about yourself then. yeah well I'm a history professor at McAllister College I um, teach US history um, history of childhood history of women and uh, history of medicine and so when my family was touched by an, um, an accidental overdose um, we, I did not lose my child um, she survived and is uh, thriving and really well and happy today um, but I was shocked I never could have imagined that being a, a child of the 70s and 80s, that was not something that uh, was familiar to me as a drug. I didn't even know people had access to it. Somehow I'd missed the whole uh, prescription drug, you know, um, problem with younger children. I, I mean, I'd heard of it, but I didn't understand it. Um, and then this experience just really galvanized me to do my own research. And one of the things I do in my research is I'm an oral historian. So I look for projects that are more current history. Um, and I interview people. And so after talking to several doctors um, and other parents, going to support groups, I decided I needed to collect as many histories as I could from people experiencing this right now. Um, historians look for change where change is happening and that's where I go with with my projects what changed so um, I interviewed more than 60 people Lori I it was the moms I went to first because we had more we had things in common um, I was just touched and um, humbled by the generosity that they that they gave in their um, in their stories, their willingness to share really, really painful things, and then to have them trust me to put their stories into my book. Um, about 25 people end up in the book, uh, Opioid Reckoning, out of the 60. Um, but it's a, it, it's been an incredible experience, and I learned more than I ever could have imagined about the opioid epidemic and, and really the drug crisis in our country as well. And for the same reason, I wanted to have two moms on the show as well to talk about this, you know, this um, topic and this epidemic and this crisis and all of that. Before we get a little bit more about, I want to hear more about your book, but also, um, Amy, I mean, um, Lori, tell us a little bit more about Ryan, your son. 
So he, um, again, our first child, and um, I always say he came out of the womb just ready to go. Um, you know, th throughout his, his short life, um, you knew when Ryan was around, he was just a freight train coming through the house. I mean, he'd open the door and it's, I'm home, and um, just full of life. He was um, an artist, loved to draw, um, paint, um, sketch. Uh, he was always busy, 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 busy doing something. He self-taught himself, he was a musician, self-taught himself how to play um, guitar, keyboards, drums, taught his little brother how to play the drums. Um, they had a garage band. Um, quirky sense of humor. Uh, he, he, you know, at his um, conferences, the teachers would just say, you're Ryan's mom, sit down, I have to tell you a story. I mean, every one of them, Aww. you know, and um, warm, heard, yeah. I've actually, um, some, um, some of them have, friends have reached out to me and, and they share stories with me and um, you know things I didn't even know about him and he was just he was just so kind and compassionate and caring and a great friend to his friends um, so he was just the life of the party and mm -hmm. um, you know uh, unfortunately a risk taker and liked adventure and I mean that's how I was and am still so um, just so full of life so it's definitely a void. Um, you know, that we all experience with his, with this loss. And Amy, is something that you've been seeing with interviewing all these different families as well, the same sort of, about these remarkable young people, not always young people, but just remarkable oh, right. individuals. And the thing, yeah, so many, so many beautiful people. And I, I think, you know, you starting with losing 100,000 people, um, in a year, that's just an, a, that's a staggering number. We haven't seen something like that since the HIV AIDS epidemic. And it, it, it reminds me of it often. But I think about the, think about the people that we lost um, in that time, the artists, the musicians, the writers. Um, it, it's a really you know, similar loss. And just because someone is, I think what I, what, when we say things like, um, we were just a regular family. There's this separation um, that we make when we're when we do that that we should probably stop doing in some ways because everybody was somebody's child, and I think that you you know the mothers all say this too like well yes I lost my child but I don't want anyone to lose their mm -hmm. child either. I so want it's anyone, no. so it's that it's that. Um, separating of us and them, like there's certain kinds of people who use drugs, which is, it's an old, it's an old trope. And I, I that's one of the things that I learned the most um, at, because I had held that idea as well. Mm -hmm. um, but yes, just too many, too many amazing people um, who can't access the kind of care that they need. One of the reasons why you have the book and it's called The Opiate Reckoning, Love, Loss and Redemption in the Rehab State. So tell us about your book. Thank you. Do you want me to hold it? <laughs> <laughs> and, I love again, the cover. I should say, too, I when I was reading it, I just couldn't wait to turn the next page. I mean, it was just riveting. I well, mean, I was thank you. Really I just, love writing. I just wanted to read another page, another page. Thank I was you. up lo late, longer, <laughs> stayed up much thank later yeah, than yeah, I thought yeah. I was going to reading it. Yeah. Well, I really, I, I really appreciate hearing that. Um, the book was just also uh, named finalist in the nonfiction category for the Minnesota Book Award. That is yeah, fantastic. so I feel kind of um, sorry. I keep touching myself. Um, <laughs> my, I keep touching my microphone. Um, anyway, so you were asking me something. Now I've forgotten. Why? why the oh, why book? Minnesota? Yeah. Yes. So Minnesota. What I learned, which I did not know. Uh, when I started this project in 2015 was that Minnesota is the epicenter, the founding state for what we understand to be drug treatment um, in terms of the 12-step rehab model, which starts with abstinence, started in the 50s uh, with Hazelden, Wilmer State Hospital, and Pioneer House. And so I won't go off into a long lecture that I give, <laughs> but I will to say, one of your classes. <laughs> I will say, yes, I do teach a class on the history of drugs, addiction, and recovery. Um, but what I will say is that the, the model that was developed here in Minnesota is very powerful for people in, who've used alcohol and maybe some other drugs, cocaine maybe. But when you apply it to opioids, when you try to just stop, it becomes very, very difficult because of a physiological 
um, addiction to the drug and of, to, the, to opioids. So what I learned is that we also have other models that were created in medicine with methadone. Methadone was stigmatized because it was used in inner city populations. So people from suburban and affluent areas would never think about methadone. Luckily, we have a new drug, Suboxone, uh, 2011, that's starting to get more and more traction with, with physicians. Um, and it, so there's just these different models that have developed over time that aren't really talking to each other. And what, I was, what I'm hoping with the way that I've laid this out in the book is that we'll start to see here in Minnesota the way that we could be a real leader in combining medicine, the 12-step you know, recovery kind of community program for people, the peer support, and then harm reduction. We need, we need to save people before they die, um, whether they're under a bridge or they're in your bed, your, their childhood bedroom. We need to save them <laughs> so they can get the help that they need. So we really need to kind of combine these interventions and these, these, um, these ways to help people. One, one way will not yeah, we'll even one it. life, but more than that. And that's what you're doing, too, with the, the work that you're doing with the FBI and talking to students and the community. We're running short on time, but just briefly, why you continue to do that? And what do you um, enjoy about that? Uh, as Amy said, and Lee, you said, you know, even if it's just one life, um, I when I go out and talk at these forums, um, you know, I'll have multiple parents come up to me after, or, you know, grandparents, whatever, thank you so much you know, this made a big difference. This is what I'm going to do when I go home. And um, so that that is why I do this. And because um, I'm doing it for Ryan. Um, and that is the bottom line. Yeah. Final comments that you want to leave for our viewers, Amy? I would say everyone can get Narcan now. Get Narcan. I. Uh, it's very easy to use. It's very easy to find training. There's even online training. One of my students saved a total stranger on a St. Paul bus. Oh, that's just amazing. amazing. I know. I know. <laughs> so yeah. I, I, wow. I'm the just like, we can all, you, if you can carry it and it doesn't bother you to carry it, carry it. Because yes. you never know who you might, whose life you might uh, save in that moment. Well, it really has been a pleasure to have you both with us on Inside Healthcare. So thank you and glad to have you back and thank come you. back again. Thank and you, thank you Jody, yeah, it was and lovely. And pleasure and yeah, thank you. love the book. So thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.